glad to be here today and take you on a journey and hopefully you'll enjoy the memories that we have and maybe learn some things along the way. We were Wayne County residents, unlike most of you here, uh, we went to school in Smithville. We dated in high school, we dated in college, we got married, we got teaching jobs, we bought a house. In the early 1970s, when the story begins, we were living the American dream. But, I think it was Yogi Berra that said, if you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> Our fork in the road was a young man named Gary who had determined that I was going to be the cross country coach at the school that I was uh, teaching at. I had no idea about what was going to happen, but I said, okay. So now my team is running, and I start running with them. And pretty soon I find, even though the season's over, I'm still going out and running. And then pretty soon I'm learning that I can't wait to go to bed because I can get up the next morning and run some more. I, I think I was getting one of those addictions that we were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I ran more and I trained harder. And I, as all runners do, that natural progression, we started going to some road races. So I went to some road races. And I really wasn't very good because I'd been a sprinter and a, a jumper in high school. But I was having a lot of fun. And, and soon I was starting to even win a few plaques and trophies along the way as age group winners raised up. You know? And then the natural progression continues on to the marathon. And I ran a couple of marathons, and then I qualified for Boston. And then as the story continues, I was in my mid to late 20s. And what usually happens is if you lead a sedentary lifestyle, you gain a little bit of weight. So I thought, you know, I really don't like this. Tom's running. I think running is supposed to be good for losing weight. So since he was a coach, I thought he could set me on the right track. So there was such a thing as Cooper's 12-minute test. And the object was to go to the track, run as far as you could in 12 minutes, and then look at this little chart to see how fit you were. And he thought that would be a great place to start training me to be able to run. So one sunny afternoon, we went to the track. I was on the line, he had a stopwatch, and I started to run. And I didn't get one lap around the track before I started to walk. So I walked and I jogged and I walked and I jogged and found out I wasn't in very good shape. But bless his heart, he let me tag along with him when he went out on his runs. And soon I was running a lot faster. And there was an advertisement for the Worcester 10K, which he was going to run. And I thought, well, you know, I'm going to run. And lo and behold, I finished second in my age group. And this was the first athletic award I had ever won in my life. And for those of you who don't realize what life was back in the 60s, there was no such thing as girls' athletics. So I was in a totally uncharted area for myself. And I thought, you know, this is kind of fun. He's training for Boston. You know, why don't I have him train me for a marathon? So I said, Coach, be ready to run Boston. Now this was a bit of a challenge, but <laughs> we could handle it. She's the most game runner I've ever seen. She would tag along and hang on as long as she could. And, and the mileage went up. We were doing 70 miles a week now and doing pretty good. Uh, you know, training pretty good. And we decided, and we looked at our schedule and said, okay, we'll go to Huntsville in December because our coaching responsibilities were for the year. We went to Huntsville. It's December, but it's you know, far enough south that it's still kind of cool, so you can you can get like, a good day for a marathon. So we called down to Huntsville, and they said, "Yeah, come on down. We're glad to have you," and, and so forth. And the race went well. I mean, we were running along. We had our time and parameters that we were running, and uh, clipping them off just just like clockwork. It was it was actually an easy marathon if a marathon can be easy. Okay. 
The surprising part came at the end. First of all, Jim had two hours and 56 minutes, which is pretty quick, yeah, very quick. And second of all, she won the race. <laughs> so first marathon win with a time under three hours was, was really something. And a better part of us, before we left, they invited us back next year and said, we'll send you plane tickets, we'll take you to the airport, we'll get you up to the hotel, we'll give you money for food. Hey, this was, this was living the dream now. <laughs> So, anyway, we went home, and we obviously trained a little bit more, and spring rolled around, and it was time to run Boston. And what a great experience that was. I don't remember for sure, but I think I finished 21st, which wasn't bad in a big international race like that. And the thing that I remember most is I thought, you know, I love this marathon bit. And I think I'm going to be a marathon runner forever. And so that's where the story continues because, like Tom said, we went back to Huntsville and I ran a 248, I believe. So that was under 250. That was good. And the thing that was really exciting about that race is later on, I got a letter from Nike. And Nike said, would you like to run for us? And you know how great Christmas is. Well, imagine Christmas from Nike, two times a year. Big boxes, six pairs of shoes in a box, racing gear, and all of this stuff. And a couple plane tickets a year to go to my race of choice. This was really, really great. And so, at now, Coach has to take over even more. We sat down, this is 1981. Most of you weren't born yet, we understand that. <laughs> but it was 1981, and they just announced that there was going to be the Olympic trials for women. The first uh, marathon for women was going to be in the 1984 trials. So we sat down in 81 and set our goals. And our goals were uh, spring season, we were going to train for strength and speed run local races, now we're doing 80 to 90 miles a week, and we're going to the weight room two or three times a week, and a, a regular day might consist of getting up and running before school, going to school, coaching, coming home, running, and then going, having supper, going to the weight room, coming home, going to bed, repeat the next day. So, and of course our long-term goal here was followed by the Boston Marathon. So that we're looking at that, and we're thinking, hmm, there's a nice race in Columbus that'll save us a lot of travel. So we went to Columbus and just to see where we were. We didn't really have any time goal, but we went down there and we said, let's see what happens. We got there and it was a marathon nightmare. It was 70 some degrees at the start of the race, 80 degrees at the finish of the race, and 30% plus drop out of the race. Still ended up running at 242. Okay, so we thought that's pretty good. That, that's doing pretty good considering the heat. But at the same time, we said, we got to sub-250 or 240 and we can run under that, or sub-250, sub right? Yeah. 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 So we, we called our friends in Huntsville. You know, it's a sub-240? Yeah. yeah. So we called our... But Tokyo comes in. Oh, Tokyo, that's right. We did not get to go back. I am all my stuff already. Yeah, we can go back to Huntsville. We can go back to Huntsville that year. We, we came back home and instead, you know, normally our routine is to go home, rest all day, run faster, train harder, do the whole routine again. This year we went up town and got mail, and there was a letter for Jane. And I said, Jane, what does it say? What's it say? And this letter was, please call me Collect, if you even know what calling Collect is, as soon as possible if you are interested in representing the U.S. in Tokyo, Japan on November 15th for the Women's International Marathon. Thank you. Nina Kusick, Chairman of the Women's Long Distance Running Committee. We looked at each other and we go, oh my gosh, how can we pass up this opportunity? I don't have a passport. <laughs> we have never considered running internationally. It takes weeks to get a passport. I had to be ready to go in three weeks. What on earth am I going to do? We get on the phone to our congressman. Our congressman expedites the passport. Tom puts me on a plane. I fly from Cleveland to, t 
Tokyo to run in this international marathon where there are 52 other women from around the world, very elite. We start and finish in Olympic Stadium. For 52 women, they shut down the streets of Tokyo, Japan, and you run this race. And lo and behold, I finished some. And what a thrill that was. And so I went home to my husband, the coach, and said, you know, you've got to train me. I've got to run harder, and I've got to run faster. It's up to you. So now it's 1982, and we've already determined with our long-term goal of qualifying for the Olympic trials, the 83 is going to be our first shot at Grandma's Marathon in Duluth, Minnesota. So in 82, we called up there and said, hey, can we come up and run? They said, oh yeah, come on up. We'll send you some tickets and stuff. And we just wanted to see the course in advance, so we weren't seeing it for the first time. So we went up, had a good race. It's a beautiful course, it runs along Lake Superior, had a wonderful time. We came back home, we trained harder, we ran faster, and we went back to Columbus that fall. That fall, was our, our goal was to break, so, uh, break two hours and 40 minutes. Once you break 240, you're into the elite. We went to Columbus, and that's when we got the hot weather. Sorry, I got mixed up before. We got hot weather, ran a really good race, actually won the race, which was kind of unexpected at the time, and then uh, came back home and said, golly, we're so fit. And because it was so hot, we couldn't really damage our bodies as bad as you normally do in a marathon. So we said, let's call our friends at Huntsville. And they said, well, come on down. So we came on down to Huntsville. And then another marathon story. It was kind of interesting because Julie Brown was the American record holder and she was going to try to break her American record. So it was, this is great. I can go and run, concentrate on running a sub 240. Don't have to worry about my place in ways, just go and run. So that's what we did, we started to run. And at 18 miles, someone said, you're a leading woman. And Julie Brown had dropped out. And again, I went home with a victory in Huntsville. And that was totally unexpected, which again leads you to believe you never know what to expect with the marathon. But this in mind, we got ready to head to the Illinois Trials. It was 83, we were in Duluth for the Grandma's Marathon, a perfect marathon day, a good field, Fast field, we went out, ran again as comfortably as you could hope. Many times I found Jane after races in the medical tent because she was able to push herself so hard that she would just get and be done. And that's where I would find her trying to get rehydrated, rehydrated and stuff. This race was very easy. It went, it went real easy. She finished third in the race, ran at two hours and 36 minutes, and that actually stood up as the 16th fastest time for the qualifying for, for the Olympic trials in 84. So. And so I was qualified at that point for the Olympic trials. And that was one of those intermediate goals, but we still have that goal of going to the trials. But in the meantime, I had gone back to Columbus to defend my title there. And this time, the race strategy, again, was pretty much the same. However, there were three other women who were better than I was. And they were out to set the American record, and they were trying to also qualify for the trials at that particular race. So they were game on that day. The object was to push as hard as I could through, oh, probably about 12 miles, and then try to make a surge, and then go on in the race from there. At that point, after I made my surge, I ended up being in the lead. And then, at that point, the game plan had to change. I was always never comfortable running from the lead because you never knew who was going to sneak up behind. So the object was, at that point, do I go for the time, which was I was hoping for a sub-235, or do I go for the win? And at that point, rather than going for the time and pushing completely through it and risking collapsing at the finish line like I did a lot of times, I just decided to finish the race out. And that was really critical because there was a $10,000 paycheck waiting for me at the end of the finish line that day. 
it's time for the Olympic trials now. Uh, we sat down realistically. There were over 220 women qualified. Jane's qualifying time was 16th. We looked at the way we usually ran marathons, which was to run as hard, run at about six minute pace for 18 miles and then push as hard as you could. We knew if we did that, the best we could hope for would be a 235, maybe 234. We knew it was gonna take a 232 to make the team. So we revamped our style and we decided this, this race, we're going out at 550 to 555, get to 18 and hope for the best. And with that in mind, the coach had to put the training plan in place to go with that strategy. Because of that $10,000 check that I had won in Columbus, it allowed me to take a semester leave of absence from school. And that's the first time we had ever been away from teaching. The Olympic trials were in May, which meant that I was going to have to do some really heavy duty training in January, February, and March, which, as you know from Ohio, it is not conducive to training. So, this was probably the biggest physical, emotional, and mental challenge I faced in my life because Tom took me to the airport, put me on a plane, and I went to Florida to train for that three-month time period. The training schedule he had me on was absolutely brutal. Several weeks of 130 miles a week. Weight training, flexibility training, and a lot of speed work that had to be done. The thing is, I didn't have my coach, and I didn't have my training partner, but it had to be done. So I was there through March, when the weather broke, came back home, we did our final training together, and in May, I headed to the Olympic trials in Olympia, Washington. This was a fantastic event, because this was the, going to be the trials for the first women's Olympic marathon in Los Angeles in 1984. And so we went to the starting line, 252 women vying for the top three places to represent the U.S. in the Olympics. And Tom told you what the race strategy was. And it worked. I got up at 550 to 555 pace. And I was comfortable, and I thought, okay, I'm going for it today. I'm not going to worry about place. I'm just going to run the best I can, sticking to the strategy. So I got to 18 months, plan was working perfectly. When I asked my body for more, it wouldn't push anymore. It just didn't happen. I had spent too much too early, which we knew might happen, but it was worth taking the risk. And so from 18 to 26 miles, I ran on in. It was a miserable race. I had finished 22nd. I had finished with my third best time. I had left my race on the road 100%, and I ended up in the medical tent. We went home, and after we thought about it a little bit, we were really pleased with the results, because we laid it all out there. You can't come back later and say, what happened if we had done this? And to take our minds off of that a little bit, though, we had another experience pop up. The, the Booster Club in Smithville decided they wanted to nominate Jane as a Search for Amateur Champions uh, candidate. And so they went around Smithville all summer and everybody was eating Wheaties and they would cut out the little coupons on the back and fill them up and send them on in. And by fall, we discovered that Jane had finished in the top 50, so the Booster Club got a dollar for every ballot that had been sent in. And then as one of the top 50, she had to send in her uh, resume, which we sent off, and then we just sort of forgot about it until... One day, at the end of the school day, I get a phone call to Mrs. Bitt, would you please come to the office? You had a telephone call to take it home. No. I'm sure it's some parent that is not real happy with what had happened. It's like, oh, no. And so I answered the phone, hello, this is Mrs. Boot speaking. This is General Mills call. We would like to inform you that you are one of the six finalists in the Wheaties amateur search for, the search for amateur champions. And there is the Wheaties box. And talk about an improbable dream. 
The 88 trials were just four years away. We went back, we were running harder, we were training as hard as we ever had, but we added an extra thing into that cycle and it was kind of damaging because we would run hard, we would run faster, and then we'd get hurt. And it got into a cycle, same injury. It would take about a year. Once we got hurt, it would take time off. Then we would have to re find a doctor and then we would rehab and then we'd get back up to where we were getting pretty good results. And then you get started, get excited because we're gonna make it again and then boom, we crashed again. Went through this six or seven years in a row. Um, during that time, we did have some good results. Uh, both of us got to run in Tianjin, China for a marathon, which was really exciting to wear the USA colors on a, on a race in China running through the streets of Tianjin. Jane qualified for the 88 trials. Uh, in 87, she was actually invited to be on the World Cup team uh, that was gonna run in Seoul and check out the course that they were gonna use in the 88 trials. We went to the trials in 88 in Pittsburgh. We went to the starting line, but Jane couldn't start. She was injured again. Finally, and I know I'm running a little long, but finally, we had to sit down and make that decision that we've been putting off. We had to, due to health problems and advancing age, we had to make the decision to walk away from what had been our passion for the last 15 years. And so now we were in our early 40s. We had had a 15 year run, literally. <laughs> and we ended up going back to complete that cycle of living the dream that most normal people live. We continued our teaching career until we retired after 30 years of teaching. We resumed our coaching, both of us. And at that point, we were back to what most people would call being normal people. Now the thing is, when we went back to being normal people, we were the same people that we were the 15 years that we had spent running away from home. And that was because along the road, we learned so many life lessons. And what were those life lessons? I think first of all, we learned that when you come to that fork in the road, you better take it. No matter how improbable it seems, you just never ever know where it would lead you. And when we think of all of the thinking out of the box and getting out of your comfort zone, it happened time and time and time again. We also discovered that goals are very important in your life. We always had, we're working off of short term goals, medium term goals, long term goals. They give you focus and they give you a direction and it makes your life path so much more meaningful. And your dreams, no matter how impossible that they may seem, who would have ever dreamed that a country girl from Wayne County who couldn't run one lap around the track would end up competing in the Olympic trials and competing internationally? And I think what we would like to leave you with, and the theme of this TED program, is that you always need to push to make those dreams come true. Push yourself physically, mentally, and emotionally. And you'll be surprised at what lies ahead in the road. Thank you so much for coming.